हरे नम इसकान हायरकी इज नॉट गवर्नड बाय परफेक्ट प्योरिटी एट द टॉप एंड लोअर लेवल्स ऑफ कंटेमिनेशन ऑन इट्स टोटम पॉल और दो दैट्स व्हाट इट प्रोजेक्ट्स Dogma and behavior, along with cutting of paka profiles, takes precedent over knowledge and renunciation in the so-called ISKCON movement. In so-called ISKCON, there really is no orthodoxy, because what poses as such is cult dogma. Faith in the institution and its governing body. Takes precedence over faith in traditional Vedic teachings. Although so-called Iskand philosophically is not as deviated as either Ritvik or Niyamat, it is not governed by creed as much as by its own version of orthopraxy. The so-called dharma in the cult is unwavering belief. in the legitimacy of the institution its leading secretaries and its governing body included in this is a very high esteem for the old guard dinosaurs who are to be understood as being somehow or other particularly special the issue discussed today is stratification and hierarchy based upon arbitrary and deviated standards and beliefs one of my friends called out a comment from an established american professor the gist of which is that religions invariably institutionalize after the disappearance of their leader or founder implicit in this idea which is borne out historically in the west of course is that there will be significant corruption endemic to such post founder institutionalization yet is dishonesty supposed to be tolerated because prabhupad's branch allegedly would automatically gravitate towards institutionalization after he left the scene The actual fact is that for the first 8 years after his departure it did not do so instead it dove headlong into the worship of powerful iskan princes and in their designated zones which functioned like quasi kingdoms and that's a variant of anti institutionalism the collegiate thraldom of professor blue blood emerged when the zonal hoax crashed and burned in the mid 80s this is established history and almost nobody disputes it however we need to return to the chief question and actually it's a series of questions does the process automatically entail after its pure devotee leaves stratified institutional corruption is such rigid stratification and its attendant degradation inevitable should such institutionally contaminated dishonesty ever be tolerated since western history shows that all of its religious organizations have undergone that after the disappearance of their founders should devotees despite that despotic track record in the west still put the institution first although various forms of corruption emerged as it went through its so-called iskan back in the day called quote unquote growing pains the accompanying dishonesty has mostly been ignored this is certainly a root issue 
But if it is ever discussed, as it was ever so briefly in my friend's recent publication, it has never been seen in proper perspective until now. There is only one providential destiny for genuine Krishna consciousness, and there can be no compromise concerning that. It is this. Krishna consciousness has nothing to do with orthopraxy, which it transcends. Krishna consciousness has nothing to do with dishonesty. It transcends dishonesty and corruption. It transcends hierarchy. It transcends dogma. It transcends the Pukka profile as being the topmost standard. Now to dismiss these points via a cavalier rejoinder that they're all utopian is to immediately fall into intractable maya. Indeed, if dishonesty must always emerge along with inevitable corruption after the disappearance of the perfect man, then evil is supreme. However, that is not right philosophy. Evil is not supreme. All good absolute is supreme. Honesty is integral to Krishna consciousness. Dishonesty is the default in the material universe and human society, particularly in this age of quarrel and hypocrisy granted. Nevertheless, Krishna consciousness is the perfect and real alternative to that default. It is the honest path, the honest way, the honest presentation. Those who represent it must be thoroughly honest. In a letter to one of his leading secretaries dated January 9, 1975, Prabhupada included the following excerpt, quote, our occupation must be honest. Everyone should adore our members as honest. These dishonest methods must be stopped. It is hampering our reputation all over the world." Unquote. Once dishonesty and corruption are tolerated, where will that stop? Where will the rationalizations for one deviation after another end? When will the changes that such deviations automatically promote stop? In another letter to a leading secretary dated November 5, 1972, Prabhupada concluded it with the following, quote, Gradually, the Krishna consciousness idea will evaporate. Another change, another change, every day another change. Stop all this. Don't manufacture ideas." Unquote. The dynasties of ancient Egypt existed unchanged for over a thousand years. Unfortunately, almost immediately after the disappearance of our founder Acharya, major deviations and changes emerged, and a new code emerged, the code of Zonal Acharya. Everybody spoke about the Zonal Acharya. There's no such thing. The concept of Zonal Acharya is anti-Vaishnav. What to speak of its implementation? Nevertheless, that code was integral to a new narrative. That narrative was and remains shot through with corruption. It is a dishonest narrative, dependent upon imposed dogma and hierarchy. All that went down at that time was unauthorized. All that went down was full of dishonesty and produced corruption. For example, the vast majority of devotees thought, forced either directly or indirectly to think, that the appointment of 11 Ritviks 
in July of 1977 was the appointment of Diksha Gurus. That was a most dishonest imposition, and we all know those who benefited from it. Stratification automatically entails hierarchy. There has to be a hierarchy in any large group in order for it to succeed. Strict, unfettered egalitarianism is utopian. Real equality can only be found in the spiritual world, not here. We are all different, and that includes in our levels of spiritual advancement, both in the conditioned and semi-liberated states of sadhana bhakti. There can be no success without a leader, so the issue is not merely hierarchy. The issue is whether the hierarchy is legitimate or whether it is imposed. In so-called ISKCON, it has been imposed, especially since the late 70s. The hierarchy in so-called ISKCON is an imposition that is very, very false, and that can be proven quite easily. There is a great deal of evidence once you overcome the historical revisionism covering it. As per Vaishnava theology, at the top there is the Uttama Uttikari. However, within the Mahabhagavat stage, there is also a hierarchy. Conditioned devotees need not be concerned about it because they have no power to recognize it. I shall simply mention it for the record. There is the Mahabhagavat, who is Bhagavan realized, the one who is Paramatma realized, and the one who is realized in personal Brahman. The Paramatma realized devotee has all 23 mystic powers, but the Brahma realized is only developing them. That is enough detail. And to repeat, only a very advanced Matyamudhikari has some limited access to recognize these divisions of Uttama Udhikari. The next hierarchy below Uttama is, of course, Madhyam. Your host speaker will not go into detail about its levels because doing so would entail giving confidential knowledge to some readers, viewers, and listeners who do not deserve to receive it. The next hierarchy below Madhyam is Konishta, which also has stages. Below that are the Mishra Bhaktas, and their levels are basic. The highest is the Mishra Bhakta, predominantly in goodness. Lower than him is the Mishra Bhakta, mostly in passion. And the worst of these mixed devotees is the Mishra Bhakta in ignorance. The lowest on all of the devotee hierarchy is the Prakrita Sahaja. The gradation within that lowest platform is measured as follows. One, how flagrant is a particular sahajya in his pretension? Two, how much damage is he causing? Three, on a scale of favorability toward mayavad, which sahajya is more inclined toward it in comparison to the others? So you see, the devotee superficially viewed as the highest, the sahaja, is actually the lowest. Most of you know what I'm referring to here. The great pretenders of the late 70s in so-called ISKCON. They were worshipped as having attained Mahabhagavat, when in point of fact they were all sahajyas engaged in causing irreparable harm to Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement of Krishna consciousness. Yet the Mishra Bhaktas who entered the ISKCON movement after the Zonals took over could not recognize this. They could not recognize it until the behavior of the Zonals was so egregious that everyone recognized where the whole scam was at. 
Were there neophytes in so-called ISKCON during this time? Certainly. But they could not maintain their positions in that institution because the facility to do so, the means of production, was either mostly compromised or entirely contaminated. Virtually all of the neophytes were sooner or later, by the early 80s, degraded into misrefluctives of one variety or another. The point is that beginning in early 1978, everything connected to the cult's hierarchy was turned upside down. The so-called highest were actually the lowest. Those who admitted to themselves and others that they were only Kanishtas and therefore being the most honest by that admission were the best, eating humble pie by admitting themselves to be neophytes. You ask about the Madhyamadhikaris. Why? There were no Madhyamadhikaris in so-called ISKCON. It was not possible to maintain that advanced stage in such an institutional delusion. There will always be some kind of social and ecclesiastical order that automatically develops over time in any religious international organization. That is not disputed here. What is disputed is its importance. Now, as you all know, I'm not a fan of the ISKCON sanctioned biography. Arguably, no one has criticized it more than I have over the past five decades. Nevertheless, just because it is contaminated does not mean that everything stated in it is historically inaccurate. Such could never be the case, because if it was, the treatise would have been rejected immediately and never have seen the light of day. The biography received its imprimatur from so-called ISKCON and is readily accessible in many ways, including via the folio. For those of you who have and use the folio regularly, you know that the chief feature used, at least for many of you, is the string search. When you type in a word, it pulls up where that word is found throughout all of the categories which would include within the biography. As you would surmise, as part of my research for this month's presentation, I typed hierarchy into the search engine. It pulled up the following from the biography, quote, Prabhupada's spiritual family grew. The harmonious atmosphere was like that of a small loving family and Prabhupada dealt with his disciples intimately without the formalities of an institution or hierarchy." Unquote. This appears to be accurate, and I've heard it from others. Uh, the cardinal argument would be that hierarchy automatically develops, but I've already addressed that. Rituals and initiation rites were not the be-all and end-all. Their importance was lower on the scale of Prabhupada's vision for his movement, and hierarchy was also lower. His movement was not based upon institutional formalities. It was based upon individuals developing their spiritual personalities and in the process upgrading their characters. Change of character is a difficult accomplishment, but individuality in Krishna consciousness is always paramount. Small is beautiful. We find the following entry from BTG in very early 1978, just after Prabhupada left. Quote, when asked who would succeed him, as the leader of the Krishna Consciousness Movement, Srila Prabhupada replied, All of my disciples will take the legacy. If you want, you can also take it. It's not that I'll give an order, here is the next leader. 
anyone who follows the previous leadership is a leader. All my disciples are leaders as much as they follow purely, unquote. By quote-unquote previous leadership, Prabhupada is not referring to the ISKCON big guns. He is instead referring to himself in the Guru Parampara that he perfectly represented as the perfect leader. Uh, in that quote that I just read, we also notice a covert minimization of hierarchy and stratification. He was referring to all of his disciples in that quote. And at that time he had thousands. If any of them was pure enough to be guru, and he gave the order to that disciple to be Diksha Guru, then there was no need for any ecclesiastical convention to rubber stamp such recognition. This is clearly confirmed in a purport to Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, Chapter 1, Text 35, quote, Sri Jiva Goswami advises that one not accept a spiritual master in terms of hereditary or customary social and ecclesiastical conventions. One should simply try to find a genuinely qualified spiritual master for actual advancement in spiritual understanding." Unquote. Tatvamasi. The answer to that interviewer's question discussed just previously was very near the end of Prabhupada's physical manifestation. But the root of the issue had been confronted by him earlier. We find that confrontation explicitly explained in a letter excerpt to one of his sannyasis, who was also a follower of his most charismatic sannyasi, dated December 14, 1972. It reads as follows, quote, As soon as we distinguish here is a pure devotee, here is a non-pure devotee, that means I'm a nonsense. Why you only want to be in the spiritual sky with Siddhasvarup? Why not all? If Siddhasvarup can go, why not everyone? Siddhasvarup will go, you will go, Shamasundra will go, all others will go. We will have another ISKCON there, unquote. There are two concepts from this excerpt from this letter which are relevant to our presentation this month, but in very different ways. The first one is just what has been stated. The egalitarian nature of Prabhupada's branch of the Hare Krishna movement of Krishna consciousness. When something is more egalitarian than it is not, automatically that busts down the importance, or apparent importance, of hierarchy and stratification, which is what orthopraxy is all about. However, let us now segue to that other issue. Quote, unquote, another ISKCON. Whoa! There is nothing in Prabhupada's writings, lectures, letters, or talks that your host speaker finds actually controversial. There are many apparent controversies from what he wrote or said, but that does not mean that they are controversial. There are many apparent contradictions in the teachings when you first attempt to understand them. But all of those get resolved in due course of time as long as you develop your spiritual intelligence adequately. Your host speaker never shies away from any such controversies, so-called controversies. The members of the Vaishnava Foundation get all of their questions answered about any such conundrums. However, and how ironic and appropriate it is, this quote-unquote another ISKCON seems to fit 
right into the idea that some kind of vacillating hierarchy in an earthly movement here continues in the spiritual world. Indeed, one ISKCON leader explicitly stated that such would be the case. This would mean that where you spent all or most of your adult life in the ISKCON movement, where you were placed, where you were in the hierarchical turtle tank, would be where you would remain in the spiritual world forever under the same personalities as here, in the same relationship with those personalities here, another ISKCON. Seems to be. Nay, it isn't. Nothing is what it seems to be in such a mal interpretation of another ISKCON. Does any sane devotee want another ISKCON? Most of us certainly do not. Are there nations in the spiritual world? International means nations. So where are the nations in this another ISKCON? There are spiritual planets in the spiritual world, but it is highly unlikely that they are subdivided into nations. It is highly likely, however, that there are societies in the spiritual world. Would, but would they be even similar? What to speak of the exact same thing as societies and cults here in this world in Kali Yuga? Quite a stretch to believe that such a thing, is it not? And then let us consider this adjective, another. What does it mean? Does it mean the exact same thing? Highly doubtful. It could very well mean, according to the standard English lexicon, that another can be logically interpreted as something entirely different according to its own standard dictionary definition. Basically, this line at the end of that excerpt from the letter to the sannyasi was once again an example of encouragement. He is encouraging his disciple via sentiments that were more or less all pervading at that time in the early 70s. Your host speaker never engaged in any of those sentiments, but I was often the exception to the rule. To call out of that so-called controversial sentence that the hierarchy present in the 70s will still be functioning in the spiritual world when we go there is not only outrageous, it is highly motivated. Hardly anyone dared to put this idea in tangible form, but Hunks Dutta did just that. He preached it and he pushed it. Uh, that I state this should not be misinterpreted to mean that your host speaker has some kind of resentment with that recently deceased God brother or some kind of axe to grind with him. Most certainly I do not. I consider him amongst the 11 pretenders to be one of the better ones. Yet facts are stubborn things. He pushed a form of what can loosely be called an eternal hierarchy of gurus based simply upon vacillating relationships temporarily functioning in Kali Yuga. It was and remains cent per cent a concoction. The controversial sentence at the end of that letter communicates no such thing. Did Prabhupada recognize any gurus while he was here? There's one letter excerpt to a disciple at Moundsville that can be interpreted to mean that he recognized Kirtanananda as a Shiksha guru. But it is subject to interpretation by its equivocal wording. However, there was a room conversation, and I happened to be in Hawaii at that time, at that temple. There was a room conversation in his quarters in Honolulu in May of 1976, possibly on the 30th of that month, which clarifies the Shiksha Guru controversy. Leading Secretary, Srila Prabhupada, I'm just trying to clarify. I don't want to offend anyone. 
but no disciple of yours should call himself Diksha Guru or Shiksha Guru. Am I right? Prabhupada. Well, everyone is engaged to become Shiksha Guru, but one should become perfect. The attempt is what is called probationer. When probationer period is finished, then he is naturally, automatically bona fide guru. Not in the probationer period. That is immature attempt. That will be failure. Amaragyaya, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, by my order. So all my disciples are expected to become Shiksha Guru on my order, not by his own order. Otherwise, it will be artificial attempt. And that kind of guru will not help us. He never gave that order. Again, he says, all my disciples. It means all of his initiated disciples, particularly his Brahmins, are expected to take the legacy. While he was manifest, you even needed his order to declare yourself as a Shiksha Guru, what to speak of a Diksha Guru. However, let us return to the chief thread. Prabhupada wanted his movement to be more egalitarian than hierarchical. We find the following interview held in Tehran, Iran, with the Canadian ambassador dated March 13, 1975. Canadian ambassador. There is a hierarchy of consciousness, of course, but it's not Prabhupada. He interrupts him. Prabhupada. If I try to develop my consciousness with designation, it will not be effective. It will not be effective, at least in the matter of advancing spiritual consciousness. That we have to give up. Hierarchy means designation. If that designation is false, it is upati, which is always against advancement in any yoga system. The chief theme of Lord Chaitanya's movement is different. A hierarchy of power and control is not integral to it. Here are two chief themes in Chaitanya's movement. One, supremacy of faith over ritual. Two, the affirmation of human equality over hierarchy. Any objective study of it reveals this. The intimate relationship between the guru and the disciple is only revealed to those who enter into the subject. Outsiders may deride the position of the guru by comparing it to a rank in an ecclesiastical hierarchy or to some other form of exploitation, but that is either a mistaken interpretation or even worse, mistaken knowledge. In an excerpt from a letter to his disciple dated March 17, 1970, so rather early in the movement, we find that the post of guru was always open to any of his initiates. Quote, it does not matter what is the social or ecclesiastical order. If one is fully in Krishna consciousness, he can act as acharya, unquote. ISKCON, stratification, is based upon a reactionary paradigm, one which has devastating consequences, particularly for newcomers. The stratification strategy entails inculcating neuro-linguistic programming of behaviors, which are then accepted by the newcomers. Those devotees are trained in compulsion, acting in sync to the beat of the group consciousness even when it is shot through with new codes and flawed transaction concepts. The majority of those new people develop an incapacity to recognize this evil for what it is. The meaning of life, the rare human opportunity, is lost in such a compromised institution, replaced by a pathological alteration led by its governing body. The meaning of life, the rare human opportunity, is replaced by the institution, replaced by the stratified group, 
one in which the upper echelon is always allowed to have its way without being checked. The rank-and-file devotee becomes a mere specimen of the groupthink. Individuality in so-called ISKCON turns its devotee's personality into a specimen, a cog in its social wheelhouse. The governing body can only in due course become paramount in such a corrupt organization. That did not happen just after Prabhupada left, at least not superficially. It appeared that the governing body commission was overridden by the Acharya board. If those 11 men were pure devotees, if they were pure devotees, and if the zonal concoction had not been imp implemented, there would have been nothing wrong. There would be nothing wrong with them having been worshipped and accepting disciples. However, they were not pure devotees. And the creation of their zonal fiefdoms, that alone, was proof enough. As such, as only could be expected, the Mother Church struck back and struck back hard. In effect, we now realize that the GBC party men bided their time as an effective tactic. The scandals ensued and the GBC overcame the 11 great pretenders, although it took about eight years. In the beginning, those pretenders all claimed to be successors to Prabhupada. None of them were, of course. After that, they were upended by the governing body. The ones still in its good graces were busted down to Madhyam Uthikari status, busted down to regular guru, although none of those eleven were Madhyams. They were all Sahajyas. This GBC struck back during the second transformation, overcoming the influence of the zonals. It appeared to introduce something new, but such was actually not the case. The GBC, formerly the underboss, moved up to the top spot. Superficially, things seemed to improve for a while. It was all quite new, but that next transformation's veneer of improvement was ultimately proven a facade. It was still just as deviated as the zonal acharya hoax, but with a different flavor. It was superficially a different system, but at its root, it only implemented the time-worn paradigm of Western organized religion. Not that organized religion ever relinquished that paradigm, it most certainly has not, but the new and allegedly improved leadership in so-called ISKCON and its accompanying emphasis on the governing body was actually old school Western with but a thin Eastern veneer. A new hierarchy replaced the old one. The stratification continued, but mostly with new players. They weren't very new either, but they had been forced to take a back seat for just short of a decade. The pretenders' scandals presented an opening, although the governing body was forced to make a compromise and compromise they most certainly did by allowing the zonal acharyas after taking away the zones those zonal acharyas still in good standing with the governing body to remain diksha gurus and keep their adherents as genuinely initiated disciples allegedly the question of succession in terms of who was now the successor, it became a mute point at that time. As most of you know, none of the 11 were advanced anywhere near that stage, but except at the Moundsville compound, their high ornate Vyasasans were removed from all of the temple rooms, removed on the pretext that they had been Madhyams all along, but they had made some mistakes, simple mistakes. 
the zonal demarcation was now relegated to the status of a mistake as well. A speed bump. Part of the cult's quote-unquote growing pains. Their cutting the profile of Utmach Adhikari was considered a well-intentioned mistake and nothing more. They had just been a bit too exuberant, that's all. The young boys were now somewhat older and more experienced, so their errors in judgment should be forgiven. How syrupy sweet. Oh, and the alternative of reinitiation was also introduced during the transition to the second transformation. Indeed, it was pushed hard by the governing body, practically mandated. Again, the question of successor was put on the back burner, may not have even been on warm anymore. In the interim of this new transformation, remember the zonal hoax was also a transformation, the first one. In lieu of this new transformation, if one of the new devotees of a fallen or rejected pretender Mahabhagavat had doubts about his initiation and had not yet chosen his next guru, he was told that he was still initiated. Initiated by Iskhan. They received new names when they were reinitiated. But they kept their old names until they made that leap and got new names. This created confusion in a number of ways. Your author knew one of these fellows, more than one, but one in particular. He accepted his first initiation from one of the great pretenders, but then renounced him when he was that pretender was punished by the GBC. So this new fellow then, just before the second transformation, accepted a new name. We had to give him all another name from another of the great 11 pretenders. However, a scandal ensued at one of the centers of this other guru, where that newcomer's wife had her children from a former marriage molested. So this fellow decided to renounce the second initiation, the second new name, and he went back to being called by his first name that he had accepted. This was tolerated. And for a brief time, this new fellow, this young man, after this, was even made a temple president. It was all quite absurd. Some of these newcomers wound up reinitiated more than once. This meant that some of them went by three different names as quote unquote initiated disciples within the society. Absurdity started to be recognized at this point, especially when one or two of them accepted a fourth reinitiation. Who could possibly keep track of all of this? And who could possibly become the successor in such a milieu? Especially when the second transformation ran its course, the issue of successor became less important. The second transformation did not keep the pickers amped up like the first one did due to lack of enthusiasm and dedication to a great man, the cult eventually had to resort to replacing the pick, or mostly replacing it, with Hindu revenue, the Hindu re Hinduization of so-called Iska, the third transformation, mucked everything up even more. Were the new Hindu sugar daddies with their own Vedic names from India? also to be considered genuine Vaishnavs and genuinely initiated? The need for a successor was seen by some on the GBC, but who could that possibly be? Why? What about the GBC itself? Brilliant! 
If the GBC, the power node of the cult, was recognized as the successor, then all of these problems, or at least most of them, could be instantly solved. In other words, if the GBC mandated anything or reversed any previous mandate, whatever position it imposed on the cult at any given time would be seen as absolute and beyond question because it was the successor. Naming a governing body as a Sampradaya's next successor is entirely unprecedented. But following tradition has always been unimportant in so-called ISKCON. The GBC has been and continues to be in the process of establishing something very new since Prabhupada departed. Tradition be damned! Would so-called ISKCON even actually go so far as to publicly declare a commission to be the successor? Do not fall for the excuse that this declaration was taken down from the internet. It was taken down. It had to be removed. Even many of the party men realized how devastating it would be if so-called ISKCON, that Upa Sampradaya, continues as the GBC being the successor in its own Guru Parampara. Its removal was inevitable. The issue is not its removal. That gives us nothing. The real issue is the mentality that had it posted online in the first place. Like all deviant and criminal cults, so-called ISKCON can turn on a dime at any time. The banners flown at the beginning of the first transformation were trashed in the mid-80s. Do not be shocked if those same banners are resurrected in the future. The idea that Prabhupada appointed 11 gurus in the summer of 1977 has been thoroughly discredited for decades. However, that misconception can be rejuvenated just as powerfully as it once was at any time. The organized religion known as so-called ISKCON, imposes a stratification that has no legitimacy. It is velvet Western totalitarianism with but a thin Eastern veneer. It can and will change its positions. Its totem pole has no absolute value, and even that totem pole's relative value possesses changes whenever the cult's musical chairs force it to change. Reject its hierarchy completely. Do not give rat spit about its stratification. All of this has been explained to you for your edification and realization. Deliberate fully upon it with your higher intelligence and then do what thou wilt. Sadeva Samya.